So today I'm excited to talk to you all about compilers and how they can benefit us when it comes to styling web applications. So if you're building a web app today, chances are you're already using a compiler of some sort. This is practically unavoidable at this point. I'm sure many of you remember building websites before any of those tools existed. I definitely do. For me, there's just something magical about writing plain old HTML, CSS, JavaScript files, throwing them up on a server, and loading them up in a browser. But HTML and CSS weren't originally designed for building large-scale web applications. So what we've done over the years is build up layers of abstraction to help keep this complexity manageable. Sometimes this takes the form of a compiler, but more often than not, it's something implemented in JavaScript. We now have a mental model based around views and styling. Sometimes the lines blur a bit, but basically we have JavaScript UI components on the left and styling primitives on the right. It's all HTML, CSS, and JavaScript under the hood, but we tend to reason about things at a higher level than that. In any case, I think the web now has arguably the best abstractions for app development of any platform, despite having native primitives that weren't intended for that use case. While this is a really awesome toolkit, when it comes to styling in particular, I think there's two major hurdles we haven't passed yet. The first is reusability, portability, and interoperability. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of frameworks and libraries out there, and nothing really works together. This is especially bad with styling-related code. UI styling should be super reusable, but instead we have to deal with like, the Cartesian product of both sets. There are some efforts to improve the state of things, especially in CSS and JavaScript land, but in any case, there's a ton of work to do here. So that's the first challenge. Number two is the cost of abstraction and composition. When it comes to styling, CSS and JavaScript has really taken styling abstractions to the next level by tightly integrating with our view frameworks. A great example being the style components library. If you've used it, you'll know it's a really awesome way to work uh, you know, build UI, and it's great to work with. But doing things in JavaScript comes with new costs. So to illustrate what I mean, let's take a look at example. So here's a really standard button component. And then say we want to make another button by extending from the base and applying some different colors. This is a super common, really basic thing we want to do all the time. But potentially there's a problem here. Suppose we only ever use the on-brand button and not the regular button directly. In this case, we end up with all this dead code. But no existing JavaScript bundler or minifier will be able to eliminate this. I think it's super unfortunate that doing something so basic and fundamental to styling, such as composition, can lead to a suboptimal outcome like this. This is not a knock on style components. This is just an inherent problem with our current tools and building abstractions in JavaScript in general. This will be true with any CSS and JS library. You can think of this as an attack on abstraction. So here's another example of that. It's nice to express our styling in a high level way. For example, for the hover state, we want to use a transformed version of the original color. Writing code in this way comes with the cost of downloading and executing these transformations in JavaScript. This is essentially pure overhead. And as it turns out, there's actually a Babel plugin that can transform this at build time. This is an example of a zero cost abstraction. Unfortunately, this static analysis behind this is incredibly brittle. It's really easy to break things like this in JavaScript. Suppose we introduce basic theming. This is a really common pattern. But now we've added this theming, we've totally defeated the static analysis that worked before. Even if we only use a single static theme, we still can't compile away the color transformations. From a high level, it seems like we ought to be able to optimize this. So what's the problem? I think this is an extreme example of how dynamic JavaScript is. If something is pushed onto the array prototype, array literals go completely haywire. When it comes to doing build time optimizations in JavaScript, basically the deck is completely stacked against us. JavaScript is Turing complete, it's dynamic and untyped, has metaprogramming features like eval and proxies. Stack analysis and those build time optimizations are incredibly hard. So you're probably wondering why any of this matters. Who cares if we can't do build time optimizations? Today, I want to show a great example from an article titled Cost of JavaScript by Adi Osmani. So suppose we have an app that has 170 KB compressed JavaScript bundle. And now let's say we're using a Moto G4 on a slow 3G connection. This isn't an ideal scenario, but stuff like this happens all the time in the real world. With this phone on this network, this takes 3.4 seconds just to fetch our bundle. On top of that, the browser has to parse and compile the scripts, which takes about two full seconds. And finally, it takes 1.5 seconds to execute. To be clear, JavaScript can be incredibly costly, especially on slower hardware. In this scenario, the user will be waiting several seconds before app is ready. This is not like ancient hardware either. This is a relatively new phone. So the larger point here is basically, we have this ugly trade-off between performance and developer experience. So to illustrate this, let's plot this visually. On the y-axis, we have user experience in terms of performance. And on the x-axis, we have developer experience. Here we have CSS. Performance is OK, but without any abstraction on top, it can be hard to work with. So next comes CSS preprocessors. These give us syntactic sugar and macros 
but don't really fundamentally change CSS semantics. So while it's friendly to work with, there's no impact on performance for end users. Now we have CSS modules. I think this is fair to say this is a huge developer experience win. Not only have stylation by default, style isolation by default, but also a really performant mechanism for composing styles together, giving us better reuse of styles so we have a better performance increase as well. Now we have CSS and JavaScript, which even further improves developer experience. We have awesome abstractions like style components and have all the benefits of doing things in a single language. But these benefits of these abstractions come at the expense of performance. So we've seen this is because of bundle cost over the wire, parse and compile cost at startup, and execution cost at runtime. And it's not just the styling code in CSS and JS lab we have to worry about. We have to also think about all the build time things we would do with CSS, so things like automatic vendor prefixing, or things like automatic write to left transformation for certain languages, or basically anything else we want to do with post-CSS. We can't robustly do these build time if we're using a JavaScript. Um, even just vendor prefixing in RTL, this is a ton of overhead, and it feels weird to ship build tooling to browsers. So basically, we have three ways of dealing with this problem. One, we could forego build tooling for dynamic values, but this gives us an inconsistent developer experience. Or two, we could ship the build tooling to the browser and do it at runtime. This is the standard approach for CSS and JS, but it's not a good experience for end users. Maybe in the future with WebAssembly, this won't be bad, but for now, that's a real cost. Or three, we could just forego dynamic values entirely. But dynamic styling is a core part of CSS and JS because JS is a dynamic language. So it seems we have no good options here, but I think there's a path forward, and it has to do with why we use CSS and JS. I think this is really what CSS and JS is all about. We want to think of UI as, uh, in terms of styling as a function of state. And what do you mean by state, and what do you mean by function? So maybe our function could look something on the left, but when it comes to styling, in practice, it always looks like something on the right. Unless we're building like a color picker, we almost always have a finite range of styles. So let's take a look at a concrete example. Suppose we have a button with three variants. Then we have a hover state uh, that we darken the background color by 25%. And finally, we have a disabled state where the background is 80% lighter. And since it's a disabled button, we don't change the background color on hover. So let's see what it looks like implementing this in JavaScript. If we're using flow, we can define our state like this. But since we want to use CSS to manage the hover state instead of JavaScript, let's delete that. So we have two props. Variant is the enum of strings, and disabled is a Boolean. So here's the logic we'd write for applying the background color. Notice we've expressed the relationship between the normal and disabled color in a nice way using a, a color library. And if we're lucky, we can compile this out of build time, but again, there's no guarantees this will transform or work because it's JavaScript. So now let's add the hover styles, uh, which we only want to do if the button is not disabled. So there we have it. This sort of logic is what we want to do for like, virtually all styling use cases. There's nothing dynamic here. We just want to apply styles conditionally. This is basically a nice abstraction on top of conditionally applying different class names. The actual styles are static. They're just being conditionally applied. So for a single variant, this is what our styling function looks like. We have our disabled and hover states, which map to a finite set of background colors. So if our styles are static, what's a truly dynamic style? Well, you know, one example would be fetching something values from network, or maybe user input, or something like that. Since it's JavaScript, it's natural for us to consume these dynamic values in our styling code, like so. But at build time, we have no way of knowing what these values will be. This is a contrived use case, but JavaScript is perfectly valid to do something like this. 99% of the time, we want something on the left, but if you're writing JavaScript, you're always allowed to do what's on the right. It's important to note that conditional logic is not the same as dynamic styles. And I actually think JavaScript is overkill for virtually all our styling use cases. We basically just want conditional styles. So if we throw out dynamic styles and just had static styles plus conditional logic, um, what would that look like? We can't do this with JavaScript just because it's a dynamic language. And we can't purely do this with CSS because we need conditionals. So I think compilers can help here. An example of this is a neat tool called React CSS Components. And this has been around for a couple years, but I don't think it's well known. And it's sort of like a turbocharged CSS modules for React. The compiler will take a style component implementation from our CSS uh, and generate you know, a React style component. And then this is what it looks like using it on the right. So this is basically like a compiled time style components, which is pretty cool. So in general, compilers are used for three main things, enabling higher levels of abstraction, optimizing your code, and finding bugs in your code. And we've seen examples of the first two, but let's look at this last one. So here we have a function written in a programming language called Rust. This is uh, using a concept called pattern matching. We can match against multiple patterns or even ranges. And this is a nice way of doing conditional logic that also provides some extra benefits. Now, I know some of you out there are going to say, I know Rust, and that function will compile. <laughs> well, you're right. Uh, we've mistakenly left out a bunch of cases. You know, this function accepts any unsigned integer, but we're only handling 0 through 5. 
uh, we have an error in any other case. If this were JavaScript, it would happily return undefined and we'd have an error at runtime. But in Rust, the compiler can catch this bug at, at build time. Pattern matching allows you to ensure that you are exhaustively handling each possible case. We can fix this using the underscore pattern, which acts as a fall through. You can think of this as a wildcard for values not matched by previous patterns. As you can imagine, it's super helpful for all kinds of logic. And virtually always, this is exactly the sort of logic we have when it comes to styling. So here we have the JavaScript from the earlier button example. If you'll bear with me, I'm just going to invent some imaginary language that has pattern matching, which we'll use to re-implement this component. So here we created a button component. Now let's define the prop interface. We can do pattern matching against it. As before, we have two props, an enum and a boolean. Now in theory, the compiler can probably just infer the types, but sometimes it's nice to clue in the humans reading the source code. So now let's set the background color by matching against the variant. Cool. So that's pretty simple and readable. Now let's add background colors for the disabled state. As you can see, we can match it against multiple patterns. Now let's assume there's color transformations out of the box. So with this, we can nicely express the colors for the disabled state. And maybe it looks something like this. The bar in the angle bracket is a pipeline operator, which in certain languages is just syntax for invoking a function. So here, as with the JavaScript example, we're lighting the background colors to around 90%. We're almost finished, so now let's just add the hover states. And there we have it. Notice we are using the underscore follow through pattern for the disabled state, since in this case, the background is the same regardless of hover. If we compare the two, obviously the new syntax is a little bit cleaner. Um, but that's really only one benefit of pattern matching. If we have an unhandled state or make typo, uh, we get a compile time error. We also, since it's not JavaScript, we don't, also don't have dynamic styles, which means it's guaranteed we can do these color transformations at build time. So the compiler understands this is something that we actually want. So now you're thinking, like, wait a second, what is this like imaginary language that you're doing? Um, so I have to admit, this is not totally imaginary. It's something I've been working on the past few weeks. I'm calling it Element Style Sheets, or ESS for short. And it's still rather experimental, but, and there's a ton of work to do, but I, I think I can show you some cool things that I can do. So like with React CSS components, ESS can generate React components. So this is sort of how it works. In a build time, the compiler will take our ESS file and generate a React component JavaScript file as well as a flow type definition. And then it also outputs a single static CSS file with all the styles. So this is the button from before, and this is below it. You can see this is how you would use it in an app. So we just import the button from the ESS file, and we can just use it like any other style component. So in this case, this is our static CSS that would be generated. So here we can have this atomic CSS. We get deduplication if we have multiple components using the same styles. Um, and this is what the generated component implementation looks like. So we have the component and some lightweight generated logic to apply the right atomic classes for our states. Um, so since we also generate flow types, we have nice editor support. So as you see, we can, so we can import the button from our ESS file here, and then we can add it to our app. So we, you know, we use the variant, we set the variant to primary, and we have a disabled, um, and we can you know, add some text to the button. And the nice thing is, since it's flow, if we try and import some component that's not exported, you know, we get a compile time error. So here, the ID is warning us that that doesn't exist. And same true with like, all the props interfaces. So if we have a typo for variant or using something that doesn't exist, we get a compile time error. Um, you know, so we have, and also, we have you know, IDE autocomplete. So if we do this, we can get some nice autocomplete there. Um, and of course, we, we add some prop that doesn't exist. Again, compile time error. Um, so this is pretty cool. And that's only just one of the benefits. So again, we've kind of talked about this interop problem. Um, so we, can, we don't necessarily need to use React. We could also compile down to plain CSS. So here is an example of outputting to just plain CSS using BEM. Um, so I think being able to target multiple app runtimes from a single source of truth is going to be a huge win. This you know, makes interop easy. And there's no lock-in, since you could always eject just by compiling the ESS down to the primitives you want. Um, so optimizing compilers can do a lot of micro-optimizations if they know the entire state of the world. So suppose our app has these four styles in it. You know, we've seen how we can generate the atomic CSS, and runtime CSS and JavaScript libraries like Styletron, others will already do this. But this actually isn't the optimal output. If there's certain declarations that are only used together, we can collapse them into a single atom. This is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what optimizing compilers can do. So if we go back to this chart, as we've seen, I think compilers can have a huge benefit in terms of performance and developer experience. 
So in conclusion, I don't think the future of styling is CSS and JavaScript. I think it's compiled to CSS and JavaScript. Thank you.